In our final session this afternoon, we will be focusing on three key causes of persistent racial and ethnic inequality, housing, earnings, and wealth, and we'll also consider the consequences for intergenerational economic and social mobility. Our first presenter this afternoon is Matthew Desmond. He is the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard University. Professor Desmond is an expert on the inner city housing market and the principal investigator of the Milwaukee Area Renters Study, an original survey of tenants in Milwaukee's low-income private housing sector. He is the recipient of the Max Weber Award for Distinguished Scholarship from the American Sociological Association, and just recently, uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, after that buildup, I have to tell you that Matt, unfortunately, cannot be with us here today. Uh, but, but, in lieu, in lieu of his presence here today, uh, he will be coming to campus uh, this fall on November 28th, 2017. And everyone here who's attending today will be invited to that event as well. And we'll follow up with uh, more details on that. And also, Matt was kind enough to send us a video. And so he is with us here that way. So let me queue up. Uh, Matt Desmond from his Harvard office, I believe. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really sorry I couldn't be with you today. I have to be in Ohio. I would rather be in the Bay Area, but I'm really glad to be participating in this incredibly morally urgent conversation. I'd like to talk about the link between housing and racial inequality in America today. Uh, homeownership has always been deeply ingrained in the American dream. Uh, from the very founding of our country, uh, we've had this idea that land rights and citizenship were bound together in a tight knot. But not all Americans were included in that dream. You know, non-white families from the beginning of our country till today have been systematically excluded from the land. If you just look at the African American experience, you go from slavery to sharecropping to the Great Northern Migration, which created uh, northern ghettos. In the 1930s, in most major American cities, over 95% of African Americans were renters. Um, you go from the fall of legal segregation to the rise of redlining and the exclusion of black families to take advantage of New Deal policies, especially veteran mortgages that created uh, the middle class in America by expanding home ownership. Uh, on and on, you have this kind of systematic denial of housing rights and home ownership to African American families and Latino families in the United States. And you see the legacy of that racial heritage today. So today, about 71% of white families own their homes. That's true for only about 41% of black families and 45% of Hispanic families. So why does that matter? Well, homeownership is a proven wealth builder and a savings compeller. Uh, the average homeowner boasts of a net worth that's 36 times that of the average renter. So there's enormous gaps in terms of the wealth that homeowners are amassing and the wealth that renters have. So the differences in homeownership rates, which are a direct result of our racial heritage, are a big reason why there's such a large racial wealth gap in America. By some estimates, if whites and blacks owned homes at equal rates, that would reduce the black-white wealth gap by about a third. So that's one big kind of takeaway about that. Another is the simple fact that homeowners in America benefit from some of our most lavish welfare policies. So when you look at all the benefits going to homeowners, especially in the form of the mortgage interest deduction, property tax deductions, the money we dedicate to that far outpaced direct housing assistance to renters. Last year, uh, we spent about $71 billion on mortgage interest deduction alone. In just five years, that's expected to cost us $95 billion a year. Most white families in America own their own homes, and so they're entitled to this incredibly generous, lavish tax expenditure. But most black and Latino families do not. Even after controlling for income and age, black families are 56% less likely and Hispanic families are 51% less likely to uh, own a home 
uh, with a mortgage. That's another big difference in uh, what this legacy of racial discrimination and housing means for understanding racial inequalities today. When you look at housing unaffordability, you see this very clearly too. Homeowners are less housing burdened than renters are today. And that's not only an uh, income story, it's also a rental story. Uh, housing costs, especially rents, have risen a lot faster than incomes over the last 15 years. Between 1995 and today, median rents in this country have increased by about 70%, adjusting for inflation. So among renters, you see this growing gap between what families, especially of modest means, are bringing in and what they have to pay for basic shelter needs. Although homeownership subsidies are entitlements, most renters don't get any help from the government when it comes to paying their rent or other utility costs. So only about one in four families who qualify for housing assistance get it. When you look at families below the poverty line, you see that about half of those families are spending at least half of their income on housing costs. And black and Latino families are disproportionately represented in those numbers. So black and Latino families just in general are twice as likely to be extremely housing burdened than white families. And by housing burden I just mean paying at least 50% or more of their income on, uh, on housing costs. Uh, and that difference is explained by differences in home ownership among white and non-white families. So only about 9% of um, Black and Latino homeowners are paying 50% or more of their income on housing costs. But if you look at renters, it's about 20%. And so what does that mean when you're paying 50%, 60% of your income on housing costs? Well, researchers are starting to get at this question now, but we need a lot more hands on this issue. But we do know it leaves you a lot less money to uh, invest in your children, for example, and do things like take night classes or afford community college classes. We know that when families finally receive a housing voucher after years on the waiting list, they do one consistent thing with their freedom of income, which is they buy more food, and their kids become stronger and healthier. If black and Latino families are disproportionately renters, they're also disproportionately at risk of eviction and forced mobility. And we're learning that eviction is a much bigger problem than we thought it was. Uh, among renters in Milwaukee, about one in eight uh, experience an eviction every two years. Incredible amount of residential insecurity. And researchers have now connected eviction to things like job loss, uh, neighborhood quality reductions, uh, folks moving to worse housing after they're evicted than they lived in before. Eviction, eviction has been linked to depression and suicide. And mothers, especially low-income mothers of color, experience eviction at incredibly high rates. So in, Mil in Milwaukee, about one in five black women reports being evicted sometime in their life compared to one in 15 white women. So I think that if we care about racial inequality, we have to understand the role that housing is playing in that story. And this is a direct result of our history. It's a direct result of our public policy. And it suggests that we can't adequately address economic inequality and racial inequality without addressing inequality in housing. It's really hard to imagine a social policy that more sweepingly and unblushingly amplifies our racial and economic inequality than our currently, current housing policy does. You know, we give most help to families that don't need it, affluent homeowners, and we give no help to families that need it the most, low-income renters, disproportionately for people of color. So if that's how we're going to spend our money, if we're going to spend the bulk of our public dollars on the affluent, when it comes to housing, I think we should be honest about that and own up to that and stop repeating this idea that the richest nation on the planet can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in America and if racial inequality persists in America, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. Thank you so much. Have a great conference. Matt Desmond. Uh, again, he'll, he'll be here November 28th, 2017, and, and uh, if you're signed in with us here today, you'll be invited. I want to turn to our next speaker. Uh, C. Matthew Snip is the Burnett C. and Mildred Finley Walford Professor of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford. 
He's director of the Institute for Research in the Social Sciences Secure Data Center and former director of the Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity, our co-sponsor here today. Professor Snip is an expert on economic development, poverty, and unemployment. And importantly, very importantly to us, also at the center, he is an expert on the US Census. For nearly 10 years, he served as an appointed member of the Census Bureau's Racial and Ethnic Advisory Committee, and he's currently involved in the planning for the 2020 Census. He also leads the Race, Ethnicity, and Immigration Research Group at the Center on Poverty and Inequality. C. Matthew Snip. Okay, well, thank you, Charles. And I want to thank David uh, for having me here today and for the important work that his center does. And thank all of you for being here and taking the time out of your day to uh, spend it with us. Um, so my topic for today is earnings. And earnings are particularly important because for most people, uh, this is the way they earn their livelihood, uh, by exchanging their labor uh, uh, with, with an employer. And I want to begin with some prefatory comments. Uh, first of all, we're going to begin looking at earnings inequality by race and by gender. And we're going to start with uh, 1970 up to the uh, year 2010. And the year 1970 is important because that's more or less uh, when people mark the, the beginning of the post-civil rights era. So there was a lot of legislation that was put in place during the 1960s. Uh, and so following the impact of that legislation over time, uh, you know, fair, fair employment laws and the like, following that legislation over time is really important for understanding you know, what, how much success have we had in reducing inequality uh, through these policies. Uh, the data are from the decennial census and the American Community Survey, and I'm going to look at uh, uh, between group and within group inequality. I should also qualify this and say that these five major race ethnic groups that I'm going to show you uh, betray an enormous amount of heterogeneity within them. Uh, this is something I'm acutely aware of, uh, but uh, we had to use these large groupings uh, just for the sake of, of editorial convenience. And if you want a, a more detailed look at uh, between group inequality, uh, some, of this, uh, some of the things I'm going to show you today uh, comes from a paper that was published about a year ago in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. So I want to begin uh, here with looking at just sort of the, the earnings gap in terms of uh, median income. Oops, uh-oh, there I did it. Okay. Okay, the top green button, if I could find the top green button. Okay, this thing. Needed, <laughs> needed, should have had a training session before you sent me up here. Oh. Okay. Okay, so for men over here, you see, starting back in 1970, uh, the median earnings gap uh, was you know, fairly substantial. And, and looking at this, uh, let me see, you can see that, um, oh, wow, this is the wrong graph on top of that. Okay, median earnings, yeah, okay, this is, now we're, now we're on track. So this is the white men up here on the blue line. And these bars show you the, uh, you know, the, the relative gap between, say, Asian men, uh, Hispanic, uh, American Indian, and African American men. And you can see after 1970 up to 80, you know, close to 1990, you, start, you had a, a, a bit of an increase. But then that was starting around 1990. That was followed by a gap uh, uh, becoming uh, wider again, and so by now, back in 2010, we really haven't had a great deal of change. And in fact, the, the gap is, uh, is very substantial for, for Hispanic men. Uh, the, comp the picture is complicated for women because of what happened with female labor force participation in the, in the 1970s and 1980s. And you can see here for African American women, American Indian women, they enjoyed a, a, you know, a, a big a, you know, reduction in the gap between white women. 
uh, but tw as we closed out the, uh, the century and entered the 21st century, you can see that that gap is now uh, persistently large. And the exception, of course, this is Asian women, and this is driven mostly by Japanese women and to a lesser extent Chinese women. Uh, if you looked at, uh, and actually Filipino women too, but if you look at some other groups, um, say Hmong or Laotian, you can see a different picture. Uh, turning to the sort of the, these things are out of order. I'm just apologize. Okay, let me go. I'll I'll go back to that. This actually uh, shows a, a sort of a, another look at what those bar uh, those line graphs showed, and that if you looked at those medians, the diff median differences, there's there's all sorts of things that can account for those differences. There's differences in education, there's differences in you know, region of the country, differences in the industries that people work in, uh, differences in weeks worked, uh, differences in experience. And so when you adjust for all of those differences, uh, this is what you have left. Okay, so take black men over here. Uh, in 1970, uh, black men earned about 72% 72, 72 of what uh, white men earned. Uh, that gap was closed between 1970 and 19, or 2010, but it's still persistent. It's still at about 81%. Uh, Japanese men uh, are about on parity with white men. Uh, Chinese men are a little below, but for black, American Indian, and Hispanic men, that is a very, very durable and persistent gap. Uh, women is a somewhat different picture. They, the gap between, 70, or between 70 and 2010 uh, closed a bit. It wasn't that large, uh, as large as for men in 70, and it, it got somewhat smaller in 2010. Uh, same is true for American Indian women, and Hispanic women are actually on par with white women, uh, and Asian women are probably the single success story. Now, um, to go back to this slide, what this slide shows is the uh, uh, 90, or earnings for the 90% divided by uh, the earnings for the 10% of the 10% uh, of the income distribution, and what you see is a pattern that is actually not not too unlike the rest of the country. Um, from 1970 to 2010, uh, for men, uh, that within group inequality has sort of persisted over the had gotten worse over the course of those. Uh, 40, 50 years, 40 years, I should say. Uh, women, it's a somewhat different picture. Again, owing to ch uh, the changes in the labor market or labor force participation of women, uh, the gap uh, actually dropped uh, for, for a few years. Uh, but as we came into the 21st century, uh, inequality among these or within these groups uh, actually increased over time. And so we're, we're back on a trajectory that looks very similar to what uh, you see for. Um, uh, for men. So concluding observations are basically this. Uh, the overall amount of earnings inequality is, you know, has changed actually relatively little since 1970. Uh, Asians and particularly Chinese and Japanese are probably uh, the, the uh, single exception to this rule, but there are other groups. Uh, uh, South Asians are likely to have higher earnings. Uh, Hmong and Laotians, uh, lower earnings, and that these racial and ethnic inequalities uh, might even be larger if we were to take into account unearned income such as uh, capital gains. And so where I want to close and, and what I want to leave you with is that we actually have a policy document that we've prepared uh, that for the uh, current occupant of the White House, and we've prepared it in a format that we hope he'll be receptive to, and so here it is. So, so thank you. Our next presenter is Thomas Shapiro, professor of law and social policy and director of the Institute on Assets and Social Policy at Brandeis University. Professor Shapiro is an expert in the asset development field with a focus on closing the racial wealth gap. He is author of the award-winning Black Wealth, White Wealth, and most recently, Toxic Inequality. 
He's appeared on Tony Brown's Journal, The Tavis Smiley Show, Talk of the Nation, CNN, and On Point. And his work is covered frequently in the Washington Post, the American Prospect, and many other outlets. Welcome, Thomas Shapiro. David, Charles, thank you so much for putting this uh, gathered together and, and all the people uh, whose names are not before us but are doing all, all the great work. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to uh, be able to sit and not have to talk all the time. Let's actually do some learning. And I think that's been the case for, for a lot of us here today. Um, in my time, I, I want to talk about race and wealth in the United States. And I want to very quickly run through uh, the data that we're looking at uh, the measures, uh, give a, a quick glimpse of a snapshot of, of, of what the most recent data looks like, what it looks like over a period of time. Uh, and then I want to I want to dig in and, and kind of recirculate uh, on some of the things that Matt Desmond was talking about in terms of the importance of housing ownership. Uh, and then I want to end, I've got time, with a couple of challenges for all of us. Um, but we start with um, needing a quick understanding of why looking at a family's financial wealth in the first place is so darn important. Um, we've done in social sciences a lot of work over a lot of time um, looking at inequality primarily through the lens of what happens in the workplace and what happens when people can't work, substitutes for them. And, and that's a, a great picture. We've learned even more about it today. I am going to stand before you and suggest that, that picture is very complete if we do not have a grasp on what that other major resource of family has, and that is its financial wealth. And that's really critical to help us fill, fill, out, fill out that, that picture and that, that story. I'm also going to suggest a few more provocative things around that by the time I, I close today. When we look at a family's financial wealth, we are essentially looking at everything it owns that has uh, financial value minus all of its debts. Uh, and that should be sort of the, the proverbial bottom line for most families. Uh, in the literature, people tend to look at, uh, use it with two different measures. Um, a net worth that, exclude, that includes the equity in the home and a liquid assets that excludes that. And there's a whole conversation we don't need to get into today about um, how one thinks about housing equity because after all, it is the only financial asset that also has use value. Uh, it's not a stock, you can't just sell it. You've got to re hopefully replace your housing at some point. So, um, first bit of data, uh, cross, cross sectional data, looking um, at data from, from 2013, a uh, pretty good uh, a representative sample of the American population uh, at the median, at the 50th percentile, half above and half below. Uh, that, that white family has about $142,000 um, in financial and in, in, in net wealth, including their home equity. The African-American family also at the 50th percentile has about $11,000, same metric. Uh, the Hispanic family has about $13,700. Uh, a quick, easy, I think, uh, ratio transformation of that data, I think, is a much more provocative and much more um, accessible to public understanding. For every dollar of wealth that that typical white family has, the typical African-American family has eight cents in wealth, and the Hispanic family has a little less than a dime in wealth. Um, so as uh, not just concerned scholars, but as citizens, we need to ask a couple of questions, which we won't go into in, in depth today. We need to ask, oh my gosh, how do we start with that? Eight cents on a dollar. How do we start with less than a dime on a dollar? What's the history? What's the legacy of that? And then how do we think about policies, uh, transformations that are needed to move us towards parity? How do we define parity in that kind of situation? All right, this quickly is, is the cross-sectional data. Um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty good capture of what we know. We also can look at data at the 75th percentile, the 90th percentile. Uh, and the, uh, the ratios change, but a, a vast racial wealth gap is very, very persistent at all levels here. Um, 
but what if we look at, sorry, let me not give away the mystery yet. What, what if we look at, what if we ask a different question? And uh, Matt Desmond and one or two other people have kind of set it up in a way. What if we look at the United States uh, post-1960s as having successfully passed some major civil rights pieces of legislation uh, where proverbially, and, and don't laugh, a lot of people think that makes us now in a post-racial society. And shouldn't it be the case, I told you not to laugh, <laughs> shouldn't it be the case that whatever the differences in starting point in 1965 or 66 is a part of that legacy? And whatever those differences are, over time, in one hypothesis, if it's really a post-racial society, should stay level. The gap remains, and it's a big gap. We're able to ask that, put that, interrogate that question with some, some data from the panel study of income dynamics that follow the same set of families. It's not just comparing cross-sections, but comparing, looking at families um, um, over uh, 29 Here's what we see. That gap in 1984, no trick about the year, it's just the first year the PSID got in family information about financial assets and life. It opens up at $84,000. Keeping those dollars constant, that gap triples by 2013 to $245,000. Something is happening at the deepest core of American society, our policy, our history, our institutional practices where the starting point, even if we're able to disrupt that starting point, is only a starting point. And in terms of the racial wealth gap, that has grown quite considerably, again, looking at the same set of families. As Matt uh, Desmond was suggesting, let me give a, a couple of data points here. Um, America's vast middle class, from the 20th to the 80th percentile, just looking at the end there, two-thirds of our wealth, is in home equity. That's how important home equity is in housing wealth. It's not in stocks and bonds. It's, it's not in IRAs. It's not in our retirement accounts. It's in our home equity. Home ownership then, residential segregation, becomes the most powerful structuring policy mechanism by which wealth is created for America's large middle class defined in that way. With all of the social exclusions that I talk about in my work and Matt Desmond and other folks talk about in their work as well. Let me jump quickly to the couple of challenges. Um, and, and I do this with really the, the, the best of intentions in my heart here. Conversations uh, to me today have struck me as somewhat bloodless in that um, we've not yet connected what we're talking about to property, to wealth, to power. And I think looking, bringing into that picture a family's uh, wealth capacity and how it is able to use that capacity brings those dimensions that helps us, I think, to connect some of the dots. I think it's really uh, quite challenging to talk about economic and social mobility, uh, to talk about advantage and disadvantage, to talk about the rewards and lifestyle of the family without looking at that family's uh, financial wealth. So I don't think it's so difficult, but I think we can add to our understanding uh, to the traditional income poverty level, something like an asset poverty index, uh, and report on that every and, and look at and look at what that's doing in American society. Something fairly simple, uh, taking uh, what it takes to live at a poverty level for three months, what percent of American families are above or below that at set poverty. Uh, I think we can add information like that to our standard understanding of what it's going to take uh, to get a lot closer to equality in the United States. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is Florencia Torche. She is professor of sociology at Stanford University. Professor Torche is an expert in inequality dynamics with a focus on educational attainment, assortative mating, the intergenerational transmission of wealth, and the influence of early life exposures on development, attainment, and socioeconomic well-being. She has conducted large cross-sectional and longitudinal surveys, including the first national survey 
on social mobility in Chile and Mexico. Her research spans traditional disciplinary divides, and she has published articles in the American Sociological Review, Demography, Sociology of Education, Human Reproduction, and the International Journal of Epidemiology. Florencia Torche. Thank you so much, uh, Charles, and the organizers for this incredibly interesting uh, panel. It's a treat to be here. And uh, today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, race and ethnicity and intergenerational mobility. I'm going to be brief by necessity, because unfortunately, we don't have as much research on this topic as we should. So let me first introduce this with how do we usually measure uh, intergenerational mobility, that is mobility between parents and their adult, adult children in the US. And then I'm going to tell you this is not the way we should use for comparing racial and ethnic groups. So um, here we have, we need to measure the mobility between uh, the parents, the situation that in this case the income uh, of the parents when the children were growing up, and then the income of those children when they become adults, right? So uh, this is based on work by my colleague Rash Cherry, very important work. And the way this is done usually in the US and in other countries is we rank parents, their families, by their income from the poorest families here all the way to the wealthiest families, right? And then this is the horizontal axis, and then in the vertical axis, we do the same with their children. And then we draw a line that captures, it's a summary measure of the association between the parents' income and the adult kids' income. This is what we learn here. The association in this case is 0.34. This doesn't tell us a whole lot if we don't place this in context. We compare that, right? which we're going to move to. But let me give you some parameters to think about this. What is a situation of perfect mobility? Perfect mobility, meaning there's no association between parents and children's income. Your parents don't determine at all how well you do in life, would be captured by a horizontal line, right? If you see in the vertical axis, we have the children, the idea is Everyone gets the same on average. Of course, there's a lot of variation, regardless of how poor or wealthy your parents were. Now we're going to look at the other extreme, perfect immobility, if something like immobility could be perfect, right? Um, and you can imagine already this is a, a perfect diagonal line, right? Meaning whatever your position your parents had, you have in your generation as a child, the same position. If your parent is in the 40th percentile, you yourself are in the 40th percentile. So in the US, we have a situation somewhere in the middle, immobility, but not perfect immobility, right? Um, so this is the usual way in which we measure mobility. That's not the right way if we're interested in what our concern is today, differences between racial and ethnic groups. Think of the following situation. The red line is one group in the society who are, on average, a lot more advantaged than the blue line. At any level of parental income, the red guys make more money, right? So what do we learn here based on what I showed you before? Well, the blue line here represents disadvantaged minorities such as African Americans or Latinos in our country, right? What do we learn here? Well, if you look just at the slope, the blue line, the disadvantaged group, is more mobile, right? Because it has a flatter slope. However, at the same time, the racial disparities between the groups are widening, meaning because the two groups are converging to different means in income, right? So this is not the way we want to go to compare groups within our society. So how do we want to do this? The way I'm going to do this is looking at what we call directional mobility. First of all, 
upward mobility from a situation of disadvantage. The idea here is if you grew up in a situation of disadvantage or poverty, what are your chances to improve your situation compared to your parents? And this is what we find in America when we compare whites with blacks. First, or to your left, we have the chances of moving up from the poorest 20% of households. So those households in poverty or a little bit above poverty. And what we find is enormous racial disparities, right? Um, well, uh, whites in red have a 75% chance of moving upwards from poverty. Blacks of similar origins with similar parents have only a 48% chance. If we compare the chances of moving upward from the 50th, the poorest 50% uh, of households, we find the same. Whites have a chance of moving upwards of 45%, blacks only 22%. Let's look at the other component of directional mobility. That is, this is moving upwards from poverty. Let's look at moving downwards from affluence or comfort, right? So here we have the same, uh, but it's kind of the reverse image. Now, whites have only a 60% chance of dropping from the top 20% of households. Blacks have a higher chance of dropping from advantage origins. The same is repeated when we look at those whose parents were in the top half of the income distribution. Whites only a 37% chance of falling, but whites more than 60% chances. This is easy to summarize, right? The opportunity for mobility is immensely racially asymmetrical in the US. In other words, whites have a much higher chance of racing for poverty, and blacks have a much higher chance of dropping from comfort, right? Or we can say the, the same thing in slightly different ways. For blacks, it's much more likely to reproduce poverty, and for whites, it's much more likely to reproduce advantage. Okay, this is people, this is a work uh, that look at people born around the 1960s, right? Many things have changed over time, as we have discussed today, this morning, uh, and we're going to look at changes over time. How are we going to do this? Looking at people born, this is the year of birth. So people born uh, from 1945 all the way to 1980. So you could say from the uh, baby boomers all the way to the millennials, right? And we're going to look here at the probability of upward mobility from poverty for blacks and whites in America. So whites in red, you see that the probability of moving up from the 20th percentile, that, that family that, that's, that's low in the distribution, is constant over time. About 70% doesn't change much. Among uh, blacks, however, there's substantial improvement in the chances of moving upwards. This is good news in terms of racial equality, right? And so uh, what, 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 what could have driven this? First of all, let me say what could have not driven it. Given the substantial change over birth cohorts in a relatively short period of time, the explanation for this convergence, racial convergence in mobility, cannot be differences in endowments such as innate ability, any innate attributes between racial groups. Those things don't change so fast or don't change. Um, so, Instead of considering individual attributes, this uh, finding strongly suggests that is policies, right? And the important work by Rucker Jones, who presented this mo morning, suggests in particular that policies such as Head Start, the uh, school desegregation, school, uh, court mandated desegregation, and school finance reform, equalizing the resources of disadvantage and advantage, school serving disadvantage and advantage kids, played a role in closing this racial gap in mobility. Which factors may have been at play? We don't know for sure, but this is 
to some extent, a story of resources, including economic, educational, health, and nutrition resources that these policies provide to disadvantaged populations, but also there might be a role uh, played by uh, uh, important factors such as peer effects of more integrated school environments, right? And the change in expectations for children of different races and ethnicities successes. This, of course, highlights the enormous importance of institutions in changing uh, gaps, racial gaps, and promoting opportunity. Very quickly, because I'm running out of ta uh, time here, uh, which things I didn't show you and I wish I could have shown you. First of all, the findings here are based on very small samples, which is the best we have at the moment. But this topic, su such a relevant topic, calls for research using large data sets based, if at all possible, on administrative records. And also, I've restricted my analysis to white and black Americans. This is not by choice. It's what we can do with the data we have, but we should urgently include other racial ethnic groups. I said particularly Hispanics, just because they're now, or we are now, I should say, 18% of the American population, 23% of the birds, we know nothing in terms of intergenerational mobility, but also other groups. And with this, I close. Thank you. Thank you, Florencia. If you can join us back on stage with Thomas and Matt, we'll have uh, about 15 minutes of question and answer. And again, uh, reminder, uh, please ask a question. Uh, and. Uh, and please state your name and where you are from before you ask that question. Uh, so I will begin. I thought I saw a hand over there, but it's not there anymore. Um, so here. Hi, my name is Carla Mays. Um, my company is Mays Civic Innovation. It, we are a smart cities firm um, and looking at equity and inclusion. My question is for you, sir on um, looking at housing and you both, actually the whole panel, um, looking at housing and being able to use programs like Section 8 Home Buyers Program and others. Um, it seems to be in the last 20 years that we've focused on rentals and even change policy to make sure that there's more rental housing in the affordable housing stock. Um, and so looking at these programs like Section 8 Home Buyers Program and others in, in ways of getting away from the rental, um, that away from these rental areas, and then looking at AMI categories for affordable housing that are turning into poverty traps. How, how are, how, what are you seeing as far as like changing those things? I'll, I'll, I'll start if that's okay. We'll turn the rest over to Matt Desmond. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So I, I would just like to make a quick reference, reference that homeownership is not the be all. I would suggest frame that you talk about housing security, which includes good renting situations, perhaps as well as ownership. So you know, we really should start there. For me, that really defines and underscores the importance of community development policies and institutions that make uh, rental situations more stable than they currently are. Uh, policies that talk about and all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I do think that uh, some of the federal programs and state programs we have in these areas are proven successful tools. In a lot of cases, we know how to do this. And I would point to example one of my favorite programs, Family Self-Sufficiency. Uh, you can maybe get, get, it, get into that later. Incredibly successful. That's the yeah, capacity. The last thing I would point out at this, this juncture, I'm glad a, a point made previously. If my accounting is correct, we spent about 35 to $40 billion a year in society to uh, support rent, renters and housing projects that totally invest just with the tax code of ownership, 
not just the mortgage interest deduction, but the property tax exclusion, uh, the capital gains exclusions on selling. It's about $150 billion. So the real housing policy in the states is, is, as many people would say, not the $35 or $40 billion public subsidy, but it's $150 billion uh, a financial subsidy, federal subsidy. I am uh, Jeff Greger. I'm a applied anthropology grad student at San Jose State, and I also work with a, a ethnographic research collective studying inequality and poverty in the Bay Area. Um, I'm really interested in kind of going to that comment you made about the bloodless conversation we've had today. I'm everything that's been presented so far has made my blood boil. I mean, there's we we already know about. The, the stark inequalities, and, and I want people to keep researching in these areas, but it's also kind of mirroring what's happening in the climate debate, where we have a lot of information, but it's really hard to connect that to broad-based social movements. And I'm really interested on, on just kind of um, closing today with understanding how you see connecting your research um, to kind of maybe picking up from uh, some of the final days of Martin Luther King's life working towards broad-based changes, connecting racial and, uh, and uh, economic inequality. I think if I had an answer to that question, I wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I, you, you raise a good point. I mean, in a sense, what all of these presentations have done today are, since, are, are put dots up on a board and we haven't, you know, spent much, had an opportunity, uh, given the amount of time, to sort of connect how those, all of those dots together and, and kind of show how this, this is, these, these different aspects of racial and ethnic inequality are, are all part of the same cloth. Um, and, and the thing that I always find dismaying about, you know, reading about this kind of research, and I teach about it in a freshman seminar here at Stanford, um, is that all of this, is entirely made by us. And all of this could be completely undone by us. But for whatever reasons, uh, we don't have the political will in this country to do that. And we haven't. And from looking around, you know, from where I, from where I live and, and looking around where my family lives in eastern Oklahoma, nobody has the political will to do this. And if I were president or king of the world, uh, that would be the first thing that I would change. I think, I think there's a, a whole lot of wisdom there, um, especially the, the first point. The answers are only going to come from this conversation and what we do tomorrow morning about it. Um, and it, it, won't, it won't come from any so-called so wise heads. Uh, hopefully we've got ideas, but everyone's got ideas. What gives me inspiration um, is that I am really fortunate in that I get to go around the country and talk about this uh, race and wealth and, and inequality and social justice and racial justice a lot. Um, I'm inspired by the community organizations and the community groups that I talk to um, that we, you don't see necessarily so much on a, on a federal inside the Beltway level. Um, but there really is a, a, lot of, a lot of passionate people and organizations and, indivi and individuals working about this, but they, they don't know Matt's data. Um, they don't know the data we've talked about, and it's certainly not, we've not done a good job of translating that data into actionable items. You know, what, what can people do with this? What, pe what evidence tees up um, constituency building? What evidence and how to frame it tees up uh, trying to transform policy? Uh, and fr from personally, just where I sit, that's part of the next challenge is that we need to think differently, um, especially in this political landscape, about doing our work differently. Uh, we can't continue doing the same thing. My two cents. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in terms of uh, challenges for us as academics, I think I uh, wholeheartedly agree with the need to translating, it's a tricky word because it means your language is one and it's the right one and then you need to transform, right? And it's, uh, 
in academia, you get points for talking complicated, right? And, and making it obscure when you, after you have deciphered it, is, hmm, yeah, it's quite simple. Uh, so, so this is a challenge for us every day and, 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 and events in which we are in conversation and inspired by people outside of acad academia is a, it's a lesson, as in, it's a reminder that that's part of our job, not just, you know, communicating with our fellow academics, but being able to, to address the issues of the day in a simple and straightforward manner, which is more than a challenge that, you know, sometimes it sounds. Hi, thank you so much for three really interesting and important interlocking presentations. My name is Stacy Torres, and I'm an assistant professor at SUNY Albany. And I'm wondering um, how you see the impa impact of student loan debt on the ability to um, accumulate wealth, buying your first home, or buying any home, and social mobility. Um, where does the student loan debt story fit within the stories that you presented today? Thank you. Sorry to hog the time. Um, it's central to the story. Uh, it, it's absolutely central. When you tell the story of a family's financial asset, um, uh, for more than half of us, it's about the stories about debt. And so let me just give a, a, quick, a quick example. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis uh, did a study that came up with a, a finding that totally flummoxed them. The finding was that college-educated uh, whites with at least bachelor's degrees over uh, about a 20-year period had a substantial increase in their wealth. African-American college graduates over the same period of time had, um, they lost, lost wealth. Just measured time one from time two. And they're trying to, well, what's going on there? And what was going on there is that we didn't and they didn't understand the situations, uh, how different situations were in, in the white and African-American community around financing of college, around the utilization of, of wealth after college, of helping kin, which occur, occurs financially much more often in communities of color, um, in that uh, the passing along of inheritances to buy the first home, all the things that added up to more wealth accumulation in a white community, even among the most successful, at least educated, professional uh, African-American college graduates the net end result was a loss of wealth. Um, and I would just say, you know, I will sit here and make a value judgment about that because we looked into it. Uh, we've done, I think, a lot of analysis around that. When you help a niece or a nephew go to community college, when you're helping an elderly parent with health care and a living situation, uh, dare we not call that loss of wealth? Yeah, and I'd just add to that uh, is that um, I don't recall exactly the authors, but there was a study that was done a few years ago that showed that uh, disadvantaged, uh, underrepresented minorities, blacks and Hispanics principally, uh, were more likely to be uh, the uh, victims of the predatory practices of, of for-profit colleges. And after that finding came out, uh, the Obama administration implemented some rules that, uh, that sort of limited what uh, for-profit colleges could do with respect to uh, financial aid and charging for tuition. Uh, all, and, this, and this goes back now to my, my comment about lacking political will. Just a few days ago, those regulations were undone, and nobody seemed to complain. Mm -hmm. Let me add to, to that on the same vein. Um, the issue of the amount of wealth is certainly an issue that needs to be considered. But we need to consider the amount of debt. I said wealth, I meant debt. The, the amount of debt is, is a, an issue that needs to be considered with respect to what you are getting and also what society is getting, but let's start with the individual in terms of education. Right? This is an issue, particularly for racial and ethnic minorities, because they're, as Matt just said, more, much more likely to be victims of predatory practices and much more likely to start higher education and not complete it. 
So that puts certain populations in a desperate situation that the debt, of course, exacerbates. But it seemed individuals had, were treated in such a way that they could, there were policies in place to foster and support college graduation, right, that takes a, a, a wide range of policies, then the impact of that debt would be completely different. Mm -hmm. We have time for one final question, and it's right there. My name's Jerry Anadol. I'm a resident of Palo Alto. And I wonder if you could address the uh, harm done to the accumulation of wealth by going into housing just before the bubble popped. In 2007, wasn't it? Liars' loans were common. People, you know, uh, without resources were able to sign and get on the papers. But also a lot of the African Americans and Hispanics who rightly saw this, should have rightly been able to see this as a way to improve the situation, wound up losing their homes. The financer takes it back. Those homes are sold later on in this market, and they make a killing, and those families have lost their wealth and have to start up again. Um, thank, thank you for the question. So um, let me just give a, a couple of, of quick data points there. Within the first uh, three years of the housing crisis and the, and the Great Recession, um, the white community in aggregate lost 17% of its wealth. Um, primarily, we think in, in the devaluation, the, the paper devaluation of homes, but there were also things that happened with pension accounts in the same period, so it, it's a little more complicated. At the, in the same period of time, um, and, and I'm not going to misspeak here, the Hispanic community lost 66% of its wealth, three years. Uh, the African American community, 54% of its wealth. What that, what, what that capsules for me, uh, again, are dynamics around the housing market. The last ones into home ownership, first, first time home buyers, uh, inland empires, uh, suburban developments, the, that's, the mapping tells us exactly that's where the worst damage in the foreclosure crisis occurred, and it tended to be more often, more predominantly families of color, but not excluding white families, as you can think about the Inland Empire in California, for example. Um, so that dramatic loss of wealth in that very short time period, yet um, in many communities, housing markets have totally recovered, have gone past where they were before the crisis, and that is also color-coded uh, where, uh, again, unfortunately, the lower income level communities and especially lower income communities of color, the housing prices have, have not gone back. Uh, where we are in this part of the Bay Area, where I come from in Boston, where a lot of uh, metropolitan parts of, of uh, the country, housing, housing markets have heated up totally again. Okay, I think that brings session three to a close. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to the director of the Center on Poverty and Inequality, David Grusky, to make a few final remarks. Um, but first, I want to thank our distinguished panelists. I'm here to tell you that at the end has the last come. Uh, I had some protracted comments, protracted closing comments, but I'm going to scrap them all. And instead, I want to quote my colleague, Matt Snip. I thought they were indeed wise words, and, and, and I'll just try as best I can to, 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 to say just what he said yet again. Good to bear in mind that we made all of this and that by implementing by implication, we, we, we could unmake it. So before we retire to the reception, I want to thank, first off, all of the, all of, all of the, the authors of the, the contributing reports. They could have done something else with their time. They gave us the gift of their time, and that's, that's a big and important gift, and, and, and we're grateful. I'd like to thank all of you. 
for, for participating. Uh, and again, you gave, gave us the gift of your time, and that's, that's, that's an important gift, and, and we're grateful. Uh, I want to thank also the two co-sponsoring organizations, uh, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and also the Stanford Center for, for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. And then finally, I want to thank all those folks, the great many folks who, who assisted in organizing this, this, this conference, uh, including Charles Varner, Steph Garlow, Danielle Choi, Beth Manningly, Ben Murphy, Jonathan Fisher, and many more. So there's a reception now. Not yet. <laughs> Almost. But now I'm going to protract. No. Uh, the reception follows. All of you are invited. Uh, we'll be held just out there in the courtyard. Uh, join us for, for cupcakes, refreshments, a small celebration. Uh, uh, of the center's 10-year anniversary. Thank you. <laughs>